And here we are. Welcome back to the Redshirt Sophomore Podcast, where we never sit out. We are your hosts, MD and CD. What is going on? What is going on? Sorry, this is a video is getting uploaded on Tuesday. We always do Monday, Thursday. Things happen. You're listening to this on a Tuesday. Apologize, but but here we are. Week six, wild, wild. If you're looking at the YouTube thumbnail right now, um, oh. there's a very unhappy Mario Cristobal. If you're listening on Spotify, I'm sorry that you can't see this this Mario Cristobal that is not very happy. Yeah, sure, he can be unhappy, but you knew he was pissed. Uh, every single other person that believes and loves this team, right? Because guess what? Wow, we'll get into it, but just Mario Cristobal. The ACC man. What is he doing? What it's the talk of the town. What is he doing? We'll get into that and more. Anything? Anything else stick out to you? Week six, by the way. I just thought. It- we continuing to learn more and more about these conference games. You love it. Absorb it all. Don't be too quick to judge. Come to the red shirt sophomore. We thank you for listening. Let us tell you exactly how you should be feeling about these games. Um, but on seriously, yeah, like, and subscribe for us. We do appreciate the support. Um, we're going to be continuing to breaking down games, continuing to preview games, upset alerts. Our Twitter is fantastic at the red shirt sophomore. Um, and yeah, we'll, um, let's get into it. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll talk about a couple games that we didn't preview, right? If you if you're listening for the first time, our recaps, right? Our recaps specifically of the games that we previewed on our upset meter, and also the eight games that we previewed, uh, before this. But there are a couple games that we didn't get to preview, but we will talk about a little bit. Iowa State's three and three, TCU in shambles. Uh, Iowa State has a chance to make a bowl game. This team is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Uh, TCU, Chandler Morris goes down. Looks like he's going to be out for an extended period of time. Yikes. That team is in shambles right now. One, not even a calendar year removed from playing in the national championship. That team is in shambles. They they, yeah, they we, may not make a bowl game. Let's rewind back to June, right? We were doing our our five second-year coaches draft, and Sonny Dykes was noticeably really, really low. And it wasn't that we're not high on Sonny Dykes long-term. But we kind of saw this coming. I think a lot of people did too. I don't, you know, knock him for this. I do think it's a little worse than it, we thought it was going to be. Even even us that were low on him had guys like Mike Elko, Kalen DeBoer, or Dan Landing, like way ahead of these guys. Um, but yeah, so I, it's tough, really tough to see. But good for Iowa State, man, for battling back. I want to give credit Drake May, right? And North Carolina really, really clicking. That that was an impressive win. I know it's Syracuse. Right, I know it's at home, whatever, but 40 to 7 in a conference game against Syracuse team that's played pretty good football up to this point. Really impressive. 440 yards, right? It's good to see Nate McCollum back. Um, Aaron Ham- or, or, or Hampton, the running back, is playing well as well. Playing well for them also. Yeah, and uh, Tez Walker also got uh, reinstated on the team. Did he play in that yes, game? Yes. I didn't get eyes on he that did, he did. game. He, he did. It. He missed them deep. He, he had him. He had him. Uh, crosser over the middle and he wide open um but he still had six six receptions for four yards he'll continue to get more acclimated as they get into the real meat and potatoes of their acc schedule which to be honest it's kind of shaking up oh, pretty nice for them to be able to make a run and, and and maybe meet up with a potential fsu matchup there sticking the acc let's talk about mj morris right we were noticeably high on Brendan armstrong yeah i mean talk and about we whiffed I mean, on that we whiffed I, on that me specifically, I absolutely – I mean, I don't know what happened. I, I still have no clue what happened. But no. at least my faith in Robert Anai is not misplaced. Well, and, and here's the <laughs> – yeah, exactly. And to be honest, like as, as an over NC State win total better, we don't care. We don't, as, long, as long as somebody's getting those wins, we'll still look smart at the end of the day. With MJ Morris there, but that was, I mean, it's Marshall, whatever. They, they've had a good defense for a couple of years now, obviously losing the coordinator down to Miami, tough for them. But 48 points was something that Brennan Armstrong and his offense was not capable of beforehand. And they made the switch and it was a nice spark. Kevin Conception, the true freshman, has been awesome. Right. Really nice. I would, I just, I'm waiting for Bradley Rosner to continue to get better and better. But yeah, it's not happening. It hasn't happened there. I, I, don't, I don't know that it will happen. Uh, but obviously, when we like we're talking about these previews, and we we 
we mentioned that we would uh, ride with the over six and a half wins. Bradley Rosner was not on the team at that point. To us, Bradley Rosner coming after <clears throat> was a treat. Well, right. And it gave us the that. value that we – not that a, a one transfer wide receiver from Rice is going to equate to a whole half a win. But to be honest, those, sometimes in college those, football, the reality of it is is one player like that can change the outcome of the game. Right. And that wide receiver room was not deep at all either. So it, that, that was the it, question. It, yep. So uh, so you just talked about two winners. Uh, I'm going to give you a stinker right now. Arkansas's offensive line <sighs> is the worst it's been under Sam Pittman. And Arkansas fans are not having, understandably so, right? That that's what that's what you get Sam Pittman for, right? He's gonna he's gonna groom those guys in the trenches. He's gonna get ready to play, but they're just not. I mean, KJ Jefferson can only do so much. He can only do so much, man. Uh, this Arkansas team is on the precipice of possibly losing five straight after starting two and zero, and not not great losses either. I mean, you look terrible against A and M. Uh, you lost to BYU on a couple of explosive plays. I mean, it's not looking very good. It's not looking very good. So, and of course, I want to say welcome. Miss. Yeah, no, exactly. I want to say welcome back to Frank Harris. UTSA gladly welcomed him back. And they needed a, whole, a lot of points, actually, to beat Temple, who's not very good at all. Um, obviously, you know, UTSA's first year in the American, got their first American win, right? They're one and on conference. So they're still getting into conference play. But we were expe- expecting to see a little bit more from them so far, and it's good to get them back, you know, for sure. But EJ Warner, man, Kurt Warner's kid, <laughs> kind of balled out, kind of diced him up um, for a pretty bad Temple team there. Yeah, Kansas UCF, Kansas putting up a 51-burger. Uh, but the key is no Jalen Daniels. No Jalen yep. Daniels. Devin Neal runs for 154 yards. I mean, you're going to win ball games if you do that. UCF's Timmy McLean. Uh, it looks like John Rice Plummer is going to be back for this upcoming week. But that does not mean that well, while Timmy McLean will be getting the bench, uh, I think Timmy McLean played pretty pretty, pretty dang well. I know he blew the game against Baylor. Uh, I know that he just got pounded against Kansas. But I, I thought, I think, I think UCF fans are happier with the quarterback depth in that room than, than they were previously. So that, well, that, especially a, a lot, a lot of schools are struggling for a backup quarterback and it's good to, to see that they have two they like, but for Kansas, I want to add on to that. I mean, other than Texas, obviously, and other than Oklahoma, who I think we all realize really impressed with after this weekend, um, they can beat anybody on their schedule, right? They, they can go 10 and two. Like that's not a crazy, I wouldn't be shocked if they go 10 and two, especially with the way the big 12 has shaken out and their schedule is with Kansas State, maybe not as good as you thought they were going to be. Texas Tech still trying to finding their stride. Iowa State's finally getting better and better. But the, Kansas, man, 10 wins is not crazy, which would be – I would be elated, elated for Kansas fans. Yeah. Uh, speaking of 10 wins, is Iowa going to be the worst 10-2 and two team that we've ever oh, seen? My gosh. Did you see that? You know, Parker, obviously, stats of war. The – basically that how bad did you lose by or how bad did you win by and Purdue severely outplayed Iowa severely oh yeah Deacon Hill was six for 21 and they won he threw one good pass he threw one good pass to to Eric 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 all that's it yep that's all that's it that team Cooper DeGene dude I mean stud that that defense is Playing out of their minds, dude. The defense is playing out every of their minds. year. Now the thing every is, year, like he's gotten away with it there, right, Ferentz, for ever, right? It's, especially the past like seven years with the whole the Big Ten West there. But when the new addition of the teams, the explosive offenses and the explosive talent coming from the West Coast, and the the lack of divisions, Iowa has to adjust. You have to adjust, and I don't think he will. I think he's kind of like, you know just you know ingrained in what he believes and for them to just continue to not that they're blowing defenses like, like they have these elite defenses every year and they're still winning a ton of games but it'd be nice to see like i don't know like the 70th best offense right in the country paired with the top the top three defense and see what they can actually do um but yeah i mean obviously like no k mcnamara hurt but he wasn't even playing well right and you've got other high Luke Latchley, other injuries. Caleb Johnson's finally back. Regardless, though, this oh no, I but again, who who's gonna beat him? Wisconsin, maybe. 
but no one even knows how good Wisconsin is. So yeah, I mean they're playing good football right now, but yeah, again we'll see. That that'd be that'd be crazy if they won nine games with that offense. That that would be absurd. That would be absurd. So, uh, yeah. What, what do you say we get into? What do you what do you say we get into our actual previews, our, our, our recaps of our previews that we talked about? We got a lot to say. Let's do it. Uh, for starters, you had a week. I mean, in, in a in a in a week where there was a lot of wishy washy stuff going on. Uh, yeah, it was a huge bounce back week for you for sure. Uh, for me, not so much. Not so much. Where did I go wrong? I would take Texas again and the points. By the way, thank we'll talk you. about that. Thank we you. We'll talk about that. Um, A and M. I don't regret taking them, but if they were to play again, I don't think I would take them. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, Notre Dame, Louisville, wacky game. I mean, I credit to you for t- picking Louisville. Credit to you for picking Louisville. I, Jack Plummer didn't even have to have the game of his life either. Um, it was that Jordan defense. didn't even have to like say, yeah, George Jordan. Oh, yeah, and we'll 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 talk about it. Georgia, we were all over it, right? Washington State, we were we were not all over it. The magic nope. had to die at some point for Washington State, and unfortunately, it came to an end. But it's still there. I think it's still there. Continue to see how it yeah. goes the rest of the year. Yeah, and we'll talk about it. And and I do regret taking Missouri in the points, or sorry, the the points of Missouri. Obviously, I took LSU. The, to win the backdoor cover though was crazy. There, it wasn't even backdoor. It was like end of game unnecessary touchdown. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but like, I don't think I would take them again. I don't think I would take yeah. them again. Now, uh, Maryland, I think we both would take again, and or at least yes. I would. And they should get, talk about another like, cover game, man. At halftime, <laughs> we were feeling fantastic. Yep. And and then you know, it, Ohio State does what Ohio State does to inferior teams and just pulls away. Yeah, actually, I think I marked that as a loss for us. That might have been a push. Was that twenty? It, it depended on that. what what the line was at, but regardless. Yeah, I forget. I forget what we took it at, but I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see in a second. Uh, Wyoming, gosh, we were all over that. That is a good team. I I, I do a top 25 ranking every week, and uh, Wyoming sits at a comfortable 23 for me. Is that crazy? I don't think it is. I And I think they're higher in Laramie. <laughs> Yeah, in Laramie, but well, way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, when you're playing in Laramie, it gets, I mean, it gets pretty stinky over there. Uh, Dawson's mm-hmm. Diner, a and tough. We'll talk about it. Washington State, tough. We'll talk about it. OU Texas, that was actually looking really good in the last minute of the game. And then uh, yeah. stinks. Tech at Baylor. Uh, I don't know what Baylor was doing offensively that game, but uh, Texas Tech did what we thought they were going to do and absolutely run the ball like freaking crazy on Baylor. Taj Brooks looking like one of the best backs in the country. I would take that again. I would take the OU Texas total again under, and I would take Tech Baylor over 58 and a half again. I would do both of those. Washington State, I might not take again if they're playing UCLA in the Rose Bowl. AM, I, I might not, I, I I might not take them money line, but Arizona plus 21 and a half. Great. Almost one outright. So that was pretty crazy. Well, and we'll get into outright. it. When, we'll get into it when we talk about the OU Texas game. But if Texas has good game management, right, at the end of the clock, or at the end oh, at yeah. last drive. Like they win that game and the under hits. So credit to you. Credit. Fortunately, it doesn't help you, you know, on when the rankings there. But we'll get we'll get into do. it all. Cannot wait. I, to I have it a down. feeling like like I'm I'm sniffing out stuff, and I feel like I'm on the like. like I just am ending up on the wrong side of things right now. So I, I still yeah. I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad right now. Well, I'm, I'm the last four weeks. I think I've had down weeks. Um, I still feel like I'm seeing the board fine, which is crazy. Crazy to say that. But here we go. <laughs> Oklahoma versus Texas in the Cotton Bowl. Wow. I mean, Dylan Gabriel, what a game from that dude. I mean, that, that's why Oklahoma won realistically. Now, you don't give me the BS that it was the Oklahoma defense, too, that stepped up. I know they made big plays where they had five sacks. Uh, they had those two picks and the fumble, right? Like, like that's not happening again, right? That just have, Dylan Gabriel won this game for Oklahoma. Dylan Gabriel won this but, game but also, and, and we talked about it in the breakdown where it was like the running backs for Oklahoma have not had success all year, and they didn't have success in this game. And Gabriel put the team on his back, right, obviously in that last drive, but running the ball, man, 14 carries, 113 yards, and a touchdown. Yeah. Right? That, those were huge. Those were huge plays 
for them to keep Trevor Lawrence. I didn't think he had it in him, right? Very impressed. Very, very impressed. Regardless, yeah. though, I still think I still think Texas is a better football team. I think we'll still see this rematch again in the Big 12 championship. And um, I think Texas, right? We talked about we talked about it every week. I'm gonna mention this in every video, probably for the rest, you know, of the season. 12 game season, right? Every team has 12 different games that they play in a lot. Sometimes you get 12 different versions, right? The Texas we saw against Bama, much different team than the Texas we saw against Oklahoma today. Much, much different team. And it's not that they don't have the capability to play like they did against Bama, but it they just didn't show up to that. They didn't play at that level, right? And that when you're picking games and you're picking and projecting teams where they go, you know, like you got to weigh that factor. And I still believe that they're going to be able to peak at the right time and do a lot of damage come November and especially December and early January. Yeah. And uh, I don't think Quinn Ewers played bad at all uh, for people. Box stores. I mean, oh, two picks. But that one, I mean, hurt, but one of them wasn't his fault, right? The fumble, like the turnover and downs on the one yard line, that that was also the goal line stand. That was brutal. I mean, like there were so many things that happened in this game that were just, they, they just didn't go Texas's way. I mean, look, 527 total yards of offense, right? And it also felt like, like I was talking about, like the reason that what that Texas might win this game and stop Oklahoma was like interior pressure, and to a degree, right? They did get interior pressure, but a lot of times, like I don't think Texas accounted for Dylan Gabriel being able to get out of there. And instead of like instead of staying in the pocket and trying to make those throws and and you know air mailing it, you know not looking comfortable, Dylan Gabriel just took off. And uh, yeah, and he did. He actually credit to him on that last play. Obviously, the touchdown interior pressure was right there. It was Thomas right there. Collapse and. And yeah. then which and then he just made a heck of a play. Like that's just gonna happen, right? A good player making a great play, right? In a huge rivalry game. And we talk about weird things happen in rivalry games, right? This is a huge rivalry game. Like, you know, they play this game again, the same outcome's not gonna happen. Like Oklahoma can win, obviously, but in terms of all the turnovers, the red zone, you know, inefficiency for Texas, which I guess has been a problem for them, and I guess the slow start as well, with you know, handing Oklahoma the ball in the first drive and then the turnover and then also, the stuff that went wrong for them, but they still fought their way back into the game. And honestly, in my opinion, had was in a great position to win, right? Like we talked about earlier in the episode, um, we we're talking about the under on this game not hitting. Was Texas had poor clock management, right? And I, I thought if they bled the clock a little bit more, right, and didn't give the ball back into Dylan Gabriel's hands, they can wind the clock down. Bert, Bert Auburn can kick a field goal, and they can be out of there and winners. Or you trust your defense. I you trust your defense. Your defense that has played well all year, but I know you know Dylan Gabriel had success throughout the year, but they were down Andre Anthony, right? One of their star receivers, and you just got to get a stop, and they just couldn't. And and Oklahoma was quickly down the field, right? They needed a they needed a field goal, but they wanted a touchdown, and they got it right at that last drive. Yeah. So look, credit to Oklahoma. As much as Texas also lost this game, Oklahoma did execute and won this game. Their defense, I know I was, I said, oh, you're not going to, you can't count on the turnovers in the future. They still made plays happen. They made the five sacks. I mean, like, they still made stuff happen defensively, right? While they gave up a lot of yards, like the negative plays sometimes, like just those, those big time plays showing up when it matters can get it done in these rivalry games. So credit to Dylan Gabriel. Credit to Oklahoma defense uh, for getting it done then when they needed to. And uh, credit Brett Venables for getting this team ready. This team has an absolute cakewalk of a schedule to the Big 12 championship. Absolute cakewalk. Oh, so. yeah. Now, the thing is, is you, you know, it's conference play. You still cannot take it for granted. doesn't mean that they're just going to win the rest of their games. And, like, you expect Brett Venables to have them ready to play every week, but you just don't know, right? Injury's going to happen. Can't You can't account for that, obviously. We talked about early. I'm glad you brought the defense and how well they played in the you know opportunistic style that they played in when they capitalized on these these moments that they had. We brought up in the preview the secondary, right? Billy Bowman, Woody Washington, the freshman Peyton Bowen. They all made impact plays. Really nice to see you know elite players make elite plays in a big stage. Right, that's why you love college football, um, and you just got to cherish these guys that we have in college football for the two to three to four years we have them. You know, making plays. Texas and them at home versus Alabama. They lost this game twenty six to twenty. 
Uh, I'll read some stats that Bama had. 23 rushing yards. You can see it on the screen right there. Uh, the running backs, though, you, you you might think like, okay, there's six sacks. A lot of that's negative rushing yards. Okay, the running backs still only average three yards carry, right? Nine false start penalties. 14 total penalties. Six sacks given up on offense. But guess what? All they needed was four drives where they moved the ball effectively. Four drives where they absolutely out-coached Texas A&M offensively. Uh, Tommy Reese. Looked, Tommy Reese out-coached. DJ Durkin. Yes. And uh and look. I'm gonna talk about DJ Durkin and I'm gonna talk about Bobby Petrino before I talk about Jimbo here. Okay, because I think all three of them got out coached this game. All three of them. But let, let's talk about DJ Durkin. I mean, Jimbo in the press conference said that hey, what, what are we doing to help out Josh DeBerry, right? Who early on the season I was pretty high on because he was playing really physical and he still was physical this game. Just in coverage, he's just – it just doesn't happen for him, whatever. And you're seeing him get burnt, right? And you're like, how do we help him? And DJ Durkin goes well, – well, DJ Jimbo says, well, DJ started – we put him in zone, right, to really help him out. He still gave up 70 yards on guys that he was covering in the second half. So that did nothing. That adjustment that you, that adjustment that you made didn't do anything. You got out coached. That's what it was right there. You made the switch to Deuce Harmon late. Didn't matter. He was still getting torched too. In what world does Jermaine Bur- or Jermaine Burden have 197 yards and two touchdowns against Texas A&M's defense? In, in no world, in no world, he's with Jalen Morrell as a quarterback, should not be no. should not be the case ever. And people are talking about like, oh, he's wide receiver one now. No, he's not. Like, he's been a bust for Bama in the transfer portal for two years now. He's had drop problems. He's had character problems, right? Uh, maybe not character problems. I don't, I want to speculate on anything like that. But you've heard you've heard bad stuff come out of there, right? Effort problems, whatever it is, and he was unstoppable right and he made some good plays obviously credit to oh, him yeah you know, he's yeah, obviously he made like really i don't want to take plays. anything away from him he deserves a spotlight he's getting right now i'm happy for him but again like it's not like marvin harrison jr right if you're georgia last year and ohio state does that to you like that just it happens you know that's it's whatever but this is jermaine burden this is jalen Monroe, and this is a passing offense that has not been successful and guess what you stop the run you stop the run right like and i'm like yeah, a and couldn't run the ball because their line was not playing well either. But terrible, Bama, they played terrible. Yeah, but, but you stopped the run, and and you, all right, you talked about all those stats early in the game, and you expect to win, and that's the frustrating part, I'm sure, for a fans alike, is that not only was this game there theirs to be had at home, where you outplayed them, you felt like in key statistics, right? But then the rest of the SEC West and the SEC in the playoff picture, like. I don't know how many people were really expecting a playoff berth for this team this year, but the talent is there to do it. No doubt about that. Nobody's ever questioned that. And the the opportunity was there. And I don't want to say all is lost for them, but I do think, I, I do know that it's incredibly frustrating and demoralizing for the fan base. And I hope it doesn't care about the team because you could see a game like this snowballing into you know more than one loss. You cannot let Bama beat you more than once. Um, and, and we'll see what happens, but yeah, I'll let you continue. Sorry. No, you're all good. And, uh, look, I'll talk about Petrino just for a second. Uh, Alabama's defense is insane. All right. I'm I'm not going to put like Max Johnson was holding onto the ball. Like he was not ready for this game. The offensive line was really terrible. Steve Dazio, that might be more on Steve than, uh, Bobby Petrino. But the reality was as a head coach, you need your job and only job in, in, in the game, in the game, right, is to give your team the best chance to win, right? Jimbo on multiple occasions, down to down, did not do that in terms of managing this game. At the end of the first half, you have two timeouts. And first of all, you didn't use any, right, to like when Alabama had the ball, right, to get more time left on the clock. And you had the ball with a minute left, two timeouts, and you don't try to score? Or you didn't use those timeouts earlier to get more time on the clock to try to score? Like, what were you doing? You were up seven. You were up seven. I get it. You were at home, and you were outplaying them in that moment, but you are up seven against Alabama. Like, wh- wh- in what world do you not try to score there? Oh, it's too risky? No, that – give your I, team – I, I will say – 
I will say I I do disagree with the call. I do absolutely believe this, but I I want in in terms of what what Jimbo was thinking. I do genuinely believe like like first of all, he's I think he's a little dumbfounded how how this outcome happened. I think he genuinely believed that his team, you line them up against Bama. I think he thinks that his team is literally better, right? And now the coaching staff, right, did not play up to that standard, right? So they didn't put the team in the best spots to win here. But I do think that he was like content with the simple lead. And the problem is in college football and sports and life in general, like content is very dangerous. To being content is very, very dangerous, right? And and that lets you know things come back to bite you and 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 not pushing the button, not pushing you know your team and giving like you could imagine you don't know kick a field with there. I mean, Cal Field is already rowdy. I'm sure you know about that. But like that that just does so much for the moxie of your team and for the confidence of Jalen Milrow, double digit lead. And and then you came out, you got a pick on the first, you know, drive of their half. And then it was just all downhill from that. Yeah. And then uh how about fourth and one on the on Bama's 44. You had a chance to you're you're down in the game, by the way. And uh I think punting it there is ridiculous. Cause you know what Bobby Petrino's doing up there? He's calling that, right? Like knowing that he's got four downs. He called that play knowing he has four downs, right? And he was ready to dial up another play. I can I can only imagine the arguments after the game with Bobby Petrino. Now, but I'm not gonna say Bobby Petrino did awesome, right? Five trips to the red zone, 13 points. Unacceptable for the offense, right? Unacceptable. That's how you lose that's how you lose games like this, right? Uh, and then at the end of the game, right there. Are you kidding me? You burn a timeout there on the two yard line, fourth and goal, just to kick the field goal and then kick the onside kick. Like so many things are wrong with that. So many things are wrong with that. I get it. Like now, granted, if Jimbo does all those things differently, right? Like, does that necessarily change the outcome of the game? I don't know that it does. I don't know that it does. But all I know is that he did not give his team the best chance to win. And the rest of his coaching staff also got out, absolutely outcoached. Credit Jalen Moreau had a fantastic game. He was getting bullied in the backfield by his defensive line. Walter Nolan had his. Ezra Cooper had his as a linebacker. Torrey York, I thought, played pretty decent. Jalen Moreau stood in there. He got, he got absolutely rocked by Ezra Cooper one play. It was slow to get up. And you don't see Jalen Moreau. Jalen Moreau is not, is not slow to get up normally. And he he, he got back up and, and threw dimes, dude. He threw dimes. Uh, to the same corner every single time, granted, but it they're still through dimes. So this this was a this was a game that was lost by the Texas AM coaching staff. Uh but Bama did execute. They did execute. Credit Kevin Steele. Credit Tommy Reese, who it's crazy that that Tommy Reese has been out coached by every single defensive coordinator that he's played against this season. <laughs> e- except Mississippi State, right? Who they just threw the ball twelve times against, right? They didn't have to do anything, right? And DJ Durkin. That's <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Those are the only two defensive coordinators he's actually truly, truly outcoached this year, given the talent gap differences, right? I mean, I mean, I, I get wild, wild. So I, I'm not saying that that game was DJ Durkin's fault. I'm saying it was a collective coaching disaster from Texas A&M. Adam, the 12th man, nine false start penalties. Nine. It was the third largest attendance in Cal Field history, 108,000. That's ridiculous. Uh, and you're going to put that out on the field? You're not going to give the best team a chance? You're not going to give your team the best chance to win the ball game? That's crazy. That's crazy. No, I think you hit pretty much everything I want to talk about. Um, you know, obviously, kind of nailed it all. I do want to mention one one last point here in terms of just, like, key plays that Bama made and that A&M had chances to make, right, and they didn't. Specifically on third down, obvious passing situa- situations, which going into the game we talked about or I talked about earlier, that was the key for for A and M to win on first and second down and to let those pass rushers go up and feast against Jalen Moreau, who does not have great pocket presence, who has not seen defenses very well, and then also your freaky athletic D line to go up against you know big dudes on on the O line that are not great in pass pro, right? And and yes, they still got pressure, but they didn't quite get home. Third and twelve, right? I believe it was at the end of the first quarter, right on that touchdown drive where they had the, the big long pass of Isaiah Bond on beginning of the second quarter. But at the end of the first quarter, it was third and twelve, and you couldn't get off the field there, right? Led to a touchdown drive in the second half, right? Not only after the interception and then the other interception, Max Johnson threw after that. I don't want to get into that; like that's a totally separate issue. Another missed opportunity there for AM. 
It's third and 14, right? Bama's driving down. You can stop him for a field goal and stop the bleeding, except Milrow scrambles out and throws a dime to Burton. And obviously, it's a great play by both those players. But again, you'd like to get up the field there. And then the next drive, Bama had third and nine again. And then Milrow had another another pass to, to Burton. So, like, and th- those three plays, you reverse any three of those, and it's a totally different outcome of the game. Um, I'm not saying a and automatically wins, but it's a totally different fourth quarter in the last 10 minutes of that game. Um, but obviously, you know, in terms of Bama and what this means for them, that's a really impressive win, right? This is a very physical, a very good, talented a and team that's playing really good football right now. Regardless of the coaching, the players on the field right now are playing really hard and really well. And Bama went into a hostile environment, which they have not done well. And despite all the adversity they faced in the game, they made plays and they won. And I think that shows a lot about Jalen Moreau, a lot about the team, this new identity, the coaching staff, right? The resurgence of Bama football, um, which we haven't seen maybe in three years from now, since three years ago. And you're starting to see that. And obviously, you know, this is Armageddon, right? Four weeks ago after week two in Texas came into your building and, and kind of dismantled you. But now it's a much different feeling, a much different tone about Bama where it's like, you look around the, the rest of the SEC West, and yes, LSU got a nice win on the road, but nobody scares you, especially when you host Tennessee and you host LSU, and Auburn is, is not a very good football team right now. Those are only the other tests that you have. And then you got to beat Georgia. Right? You you give Saban one one game that he has to win, and he goes to playoff. Like, that's very, very incredible for what we thought it was going to be this year and then what it was in week two and now back to where it is. Um, oh, you want to talk about AM's outlook for this year? You know, I feel like you just uh, their toughest games are on the road uh, Tennessee, Ole Miss, LSU. Good luck. Good luck on the road, Jimbo. Good luck. Notre Dame at Louisville. What a wildly different outcome than I thought. And you know what this was? You know what we've consistently talked about, Christopher, and we talked about it when they were playing Duke. But this is back to back. I'll say back to back to back weeks. Notre Dame has played a coaching staff that is better than their coaching staff. Oh, Marcus Freeman slander right out the gate. Right out the gate. Okay, I have some has some stuff. All right. I know Louisville's run defense has been good this year. I know it has, uh, but I mean, Georgia Tech averaged 4.3 yards per carry. Boston College averaged 4.3 yards per carry. That's not including quarterback rushing yards either. It would be higher. Uh, so there are ways to run the ball against Louisville. The first possession, they come out, they threw the ball four straight times. Or three straight times, upon it, whatever. Or no, four straight times through the pick. Audric Estime did not touch the ball until 43 seconds left in the first quarter. How does that happen? How does that happen? I know that he ended up getting shut down late, but you didn't have time to make adjustments, right? Like there were once you started, once you started, you start, once you decided to start giving them the ball, it was too late. Then there was what adjustment was you? It was too late. You were already down. And real quick. To- to interject here, like part of a running back, a feature running back, the, the beauty of him at 5'11", 227 pounds, is for him to lean on a defense and to get going in the second half to when he plays his best football against a beat-up defense. You don't even give him a chance to do that, right? Sorry, I'm continue now. They ran the ball 10 times in the first half. They ran the ball eight times in the second half. Now, granted, in the second half, they were down. Uh, I just think – I think that's criminal. I, I, I We know the passing attack is not incredibly effective – for Notre Dame, right? So why? How is that your game plan going into this? Louisville secondaries, they're okay. I'm not gonna say they're amazing. They're fine, right? But I don't know. So I question that a little bit. But uh, but Louisville, here's what Jeff Brown does. Here's what he does coming out of that locker room in the halftime, and here's what he does in the second half. Uh, they fumbled on the first play, right? That led to an, only a Notre Dame field goal, by the way. Field goal, touchdown, touchdown, field goal, field goal, field goal. That's how he ended the game. Points, 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 points. Finding ways to get downfield and get points. 
because he's Jeff Brom. Because he can, like, that's what he does. That's what he figures out. That's what he does. Jack Plummer did not have a special game. And in my head, I'm like, oh boy, if Louisville's going to win this game, Jack Plummer's going to have to have a special game. That, that, no. that's how that played out in my head. Did not need to happen, apparently. Uh, even Jawar Jordan, I, I'd say, didn't even have like an incredible game until that big run that he broke off. Uh, so it was not like the Louisville office was like absolutely humming, right? It was just doing enough. It was converting on third downs when they needed to. It was keeping drives alive. It was uh, kicking, what was it, five for six on field goals? That's pretty crazy. Five for six on field goals, that's pretty awesome. Good work. Good work by the special teams there for Louisville. Yeah, I, I thought that was pretty crazy. Notre Dame, by the way, averaged 3.3 yards per carry in the game. Can I ask you a question here? Now, we, we've all touted Notre Dame, obviously with Joe Alt and others there, as this elite offensive line, right? Joe Moore, award watch list offensive line. I'm sorry, for three straight weeks, I get it. I get it. Ohio State, I like their D-line, right? I, I like their D-line. But no offense to Duke and to Louisville, respectively. Like, you should be able to lean on them. You should be able to go into their opposing buildings, right? The running game always travels. Defense and running game travels really, really well. And it just didn't. Honestly, the past two weeks. So, like, like, is it a coaching problem that just they just don't run the ball? Or is it that this O-line maybe isn't as good as we think it is? And the Notre Dame coaching staff knows it. And they're trying to ride Sam Hartman as long as they can. And I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a really important question that we have to ask because of the rest of Notre Dame's schedule, right? In terms of the playoff hopes that we thought they had, right? With maybe USC being up, be able to host them and, and out physical them, and, and maybe they still will, but like with Clemson and and even Wake Forest, would like very disappointed, very disappointed in that group. I don't even blame Sam Hartman, right? I I, I picked Louisville to win this game, right? We in in our preview, I kind of talked about the schedule dynamics, right? These are college football kids. And a third straight week of getting up is not easy. Getting up for big games, especially when it's the third straight week of the other teams getting up for their big game, right? Ohio State, this was their big game. Duke, this was their big game. Louisville, this was their big game. That they, These teams all circled on a calendar, especially in, in the month of September and October, that they wanted to go in and win. And, you know, obviously, you know, Ohio State and Louisville were successful and Duke could have been too. But... Yeah, I, I do want to give credit to Louisville, though. I think their D-line, I thought their D-line played pretty darn well, right? Um, they were in Sam Harbin's face a lot. And and obviously the, the the rushing game for Notre Dame didn't get started at all. But, like, we in the second half, this looked like a team that was tired. They made mistakes. They turned the ball over. They got ran, the, ran on, like Jahar Jordan, right, and, and others had, had a really su- successful second half. Um, first of all, Jamar Thrash is a really good football player, right? I, I hope the whole world, hope the whole world saw that, right? A primetime game with Notre Dame. He's very, very good. He's unbelievable. He'll make, a, he'll make a lot of money on Sundays, I believe. But also looking ahead for Louisville, man, are they going to go twelve and zero? Right, like that. That's not crazy. And I don't, uh, know, I don't overreact, right? I don't overreact. It's Monday. I'm not overreacting. Okay, but they play Duke. Right, which I think is their toughest game left. But if Duke doesn't have their quarterback in Riley Leonard, that's a, an entirely different football game, right? I think we all agree on that. And then you get you, you go to Miami right at the end of the year, and can be who's not very good, I don't think, in my opinion. Right? Yeah, I I just I can't I can't tell you that this team's gonna go twelve and zero. Like th- it's hard to wrap my like, head like, around like, they, they, like a team that goes twelve and zero with Jack Plummer as their quarterback. That's not like disrespecting Jack Plummer, that's just like like 12 and 0. Like that is elite. With this schedule, even like Miami is a really good football team. We'll get to them later and how they lost, which I'm still confused about how they lost. But Jack Jack Plummer, he he's not that elevated, right? He's not gonna add that he's not gonna bump your team from nine and three to twelve and oh, right? Like, and I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna compare Jack Plummer to Max, Max Duggan. But like did anybody see TCU going 12 and 0? Right? People picked Louisville because they had an easy schedule and like they beat Notre Dame. Right. And Duke and my, like, like it's not crazy if they go to 12 and 0 and let's say they somehow beat whoever's in the AC championship game, they're going to get rolled regardless though. I, not, not to, not to, to dampen any Louisville fans, but I do think good win for them. Really happy. That environment was awesome. Right. Jack Harlow was there. Like that. That's awesome. Like 
really cool to see Louisville uh, on a night game get some stuff done. And Jeff Brown, right in year one, having immediate returns, immediate returns in the transfer portal. They, they brought a lot in in the transfer portal. And you had some guys make key plays on defense. Benjamin Perry is a really good football player. Right? He's a safety you got from um, Florida, I believe, is it? unless I'm totally mistaken. But, yeah, I – yeah, but I'll say this. There are two elite offensive lines in college football, all right? Michigan and Oregon State, from what I've seen. Uh, so let's stop pretending that Notre Dame and Penn State are elite offensive lines. I- I'm I'm done pretending. I'm done pretending. <clears throat> yeah, we, we cannot continue to hold on to these offseason truths that we all convinced ourselves. We're guilty of, too. We, we both were high on Notre Dame's O-line, and I was high on really high totally. on Penn State's line. But I was high on Bama's reality, offensive line. Exactly. Nice. The reality is the reality is of it is we've seen five to six to seven and in Notre Dame's case games and, and evidence and ex- like data that shows that that's not true. And and yes, the potential is there, sure, but sometimes it's hard, it's hard it's very hard to fix problems mid season. Ask any college coaching staff. Very hard to do so. Georgia versus Kentucky. When we previewed this, we both took Georgia and the points. And uh, pat ourselves on the back for that. Kentucky was for, a fraudulent team, and we smelled it from an absolute mile away. For some reason, the talk of the town was, "Oh, Kentucky's going to go into Georgia and upset them. No. Kentucky's going to test Georgia." No, we 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 saw right through that, man. Carson Beck, right now, behind Jaden Daniels. Right here, it's best quarterback in the SEC right now. And then there's a huge gap. <laughs> is it Jalen Milrow? Is it Jalen Milrow right now? Or is it Brady Cook? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. I'm not yeah. ready to say that. I'm not ready to say that yet. But, <laughs> but all I'm saying is Carson Beck is playing football at a very high level. And guess what? Yep. Normally, it's been Georgia's run game that sets up their pass game, right? And, you know, uh, Seth Bennett was a really good player, but he was helped out by a nice run game uh, in the second half. Carson Beck's like the pass game set up the offense, like the run game. That that's what ended up happening. Carson Beck is a very, very, very good quarterback. And the fact that George is getting healthy right now at this time and Carson Beck is playing at this level, it is it is scary hours for everyone. It is scary hours. And this the rest of their schedule is absolute cupcakes until you get to until you get to Bama, basically. Until you get to Bama. They they might not play they might not have a ranked win all year until they get to Bama. In the SEC championship, or LSU, or AM, or Ole Miss, or whoever it ends up being, right in the West, which because that thing's an absolute pig sty over there. But assuming it's Bama, right? You you won't, you still won't see a ranked win for Georgia, which could also put it on fraud alert, right? Like, is this team ready for the moment? You know, but with this talent, they're not frauds, right? They're, it's just like, can they live up to the moment when they face a really really elite team? Um, but yeah, Carson Beck playing as well is scaring me. Well, it should scare everyone. It's what it should. Yeah, and, and we we talked we talked about it. You picked him in your fantasy high, your fantasy quarterback SEC draft. I mean, the the embarrassment of riches that there is in that skill group there. And I say skill group because it's the wide receivers and obviously a loaded tight end group with the headliner. Everyone knows Brock Bowers is just a freak. Oscar Delp's a very good player as well. Andrew Paul, right? Like. And now you're finally getting everybody incorporated. Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint finally had a really good game. Rara Thomas continues to get better and better. Dominic Lovett, right, was you know, not, not a huge factor there, but he made some nice plays. And you're still getting Lavin Conkey healthy, right? The, the team is just loaded. And when you got a, a guy like you talked about with Carson Beck playing really, really well with an O line that's keeping him kind of upright, even though they're not running the ball great, I feel like their pass pro has been okay. It's awesome to see. And I, I do think, like you said, like a lot, like yes, they ran the ball well, kind like they had 31 rushing attempts for 173 yards, 5.6 yards per carry is really, really good on the surface. But a lot of that came in the second half. And I, from what I was watching, I believe Carson Beck did a lot of damage kind of on his own. We talked about it though with Kentucky, man. It's going to be a long October, November, right? Uh, enjoy, enjoy September while you, while you, while you could. 
because it doesn't get much easier here, man. Missouri is going to be pissed off right next week. Tennessee at Mississippi State is it's probably your easiest game, your most winnable game. It's not free either, but you got to go to you got to go to Mississippi State, which is you know never easy. And then Bama is your crossover, and you got to finish with Louisville, who we just talked about is playing pretty good football right now. Um, yeah, De- Devin Leary just continues to not make a step. We knew Ray Davis is a good player, and he still is a really good player. Do not let this game diminish you. Georgia has done that to a lot of really good running backs that are making a lot of money in the NFL right now, but we we saw that coming, right? You, Kentucky does not have the bodies up front to give him a chance against Georgia, and and like that came to fruition there. But yeah, I, Kentucky man, kind of get your act together, and, and Georgia is continuing to get healthy. You talk about scary. Everyone thought for the whole month of September, oh, George's down, Bam's down this year. Nope. October hits, man, and they really turn it up. So, credit to them, and credit to Georgia and Kirby Smart for really coming to play, which we saw it come. I mean, I'm not surprised. And it doesn't make me think anything less of Kentucky. Like, I don't think I saw 38 points being the difference, but I I, I don't, I'm not super surprised in that Georgia kind of boat raced them. We, we talked about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that Kentucky had to be the first victim of the redshirt sophomore fraud alert, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, this just confirmed my the beliefs that I had already. I, I don't know. Like you said, I don't really see him all that much differently. I think a lot of people see him differently because I think a lot of people thought that they were going to win this game, but that was just not going to happen. They're back down to where they pro- they were should have been properly rated um, in terms of that, that high coming off and beating for a team who's not very good on the road and but yeah, and also like not only was Kentucky a victim from the redshirt sophomore, you know, for alert, they were a victim of a pissed off Georgia team at home. So like that's we talked about talent, pissed off, coming back home is never a good recipe for the last time uh, in an underdog team there. And the line was 14 and a half for a reason. Right? Vegas saw right through that. And I'm sure they made a ton of money if people put their mouth their money where their mouths were all week on Twitter. Washington State at UCLA, devastating. Devastating Ugh. for Chris Dawson. I have UCLA's over eight and a half wins. So uh, that was a little head to head matchup for CD and I. Even though I, I did end up taking Washington State in this game, we both did. Uh, what happened? I mean, what happened? UCLA's defense is really good. Yeah. It's it is really, really good. And, and, and sometimes we talk about. Like you see in college football all the time, where you have a team just scorching hot, like Washington State was for the month of September, scorching hot, scoring on everybody, doing whatever they wanted to, right? And then you go on a bye week, and maybe you get complacent, or maybe you lose. Like something happens, the rhythm gets disrupted, and this team came out pretty flat offensively, and it ended up costing them, right? Seventeen rushing yards. That <laughs> that's not good enough. And we talked, we knew that they weren't going to be able to run the ball, and I I just assumed. Cameron Ward is good enough to make up for that. And and he is, but not this game. All right. UCLA came to play. You know, Dante Moore still waiting for them to really, really uncork him. Right. But they, they did have 44 they passing to. attempts. They didn't need to. But Carson Steele, I mean, th- th- you want to talk about domination of this game. It yes, it was eight points, whatever. UCLA scored a punch in the fourth quarter. But I really felt like they controlled most of that game. Right. They ran what, like 97 plays to Washington State's, what, 59, right? So that's yeah. obviously not a, re- a recipe for disaster, especially with an offense and a team that you were trying to find some rhythm all game and you just didn't have the time possession to do so. And that defense could be rested and, and be really forced. And that D-line is good, man. Real, real good. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd i still say I have questions about their secondary. It'll be interesting to see, like, when they play teams – like USC, like it'll, it'll be really interesting to see that. But I, I still, still high on both of these teams. Sue me, I, I'm both ranked in my top twenty five. I have uh, Washington State at seventeen, and I got UCLA at fourteen right now. So uh, I think I, I think I have UCLA higher than I think a lot of people do. I still think this UCLA team is really good, and I think Dante Moore, he's just gonna get better every week. So I'm not not that that's a projection, right? That that is, I think UCLA's defense is that good, and their offense can do it when it counts. They lost to a Utah team 
yeah, they didn't have Cam Rising. Who cares? I mean, they're still beating other teams. The reality was you had a true freshman quarterback on the road in Utah where they don't lose. So yeah. who cares? I'm I'm still high on both of these teams. Chip Kelly did a good job. He did a good job. Now, Cam Ward probably out of the Heisman race at this point. But who knows? He might storm back when uh, he throws for 800 yards against uh, <laughs> USC. That's true. That, that'll be, a, first of all, my eyes are going to be glued to that game. Right, You will not be able to tear me away from that game. And also, I do, like Washington State, we haven't seen them on the road. And I, and I get it. UCLA, you know, in the Rose Bowl isn't, isn't quite oh, a correction, hostile. Correction, 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 correction. Washington State does not play USC. They play Colorado. I was going to say, at, yeah. I at just, home. Like, at home. Yeah, I was going to say, because there's a reason why I took that six and a half over, right, pretty easily. And they're, I, I still feel really good about it. They're four and one right now, beating two teams that, you know, not many people thought they were going to beat, except me. But regardless, uh, I'll still be pretty high on them and you said like going forward. A lot to like in the Pac-12. A lot, a lot to like. Um, but yeah, real quick, what I was talking about was the road environment, right? And I get it, UCLA is not a very tough place to play. But it's still not Pullman, Washington, right? Washington State at home is much different animal, brutal to play against, right? And the problem is a lot of their big time matchups down the stretch they do have are against uh, on the road, which does not favor them and the way that they've looked on the road so far. Yeah. I mean, like the big games are on the road, like Oregon's on the road, Washington's on the road, Cal's exactly. on the road. <laughs> I mean, look, I, 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 honestly, Cal Cal's been playing points. well. Cal's honestly been playing better than. They're fine. I mean, I I was on Cal's under, so I would love a Cam Ward legacy game. At, but at, at Cal also Cal. has a brutal schedule, which is part of the reason why we're we were on the low. But yeah, it was it was the reason. But yeah, regardless, though, I, I like we said, bottom line take from this game: these were two good football teams, two good football teams in the Pac-12 that can still accomplish a lot. The stocks are still so, high. These are these exactly. are two top twenty-five teams for sure. Exactly. LSU at Missouri. Um, Shaden Daniels. What do you guys say? Are you going to say sorry? It's incredible. I- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, if you guys are just tuning want- in, CD, just, okay. To be fair, CD was on the LSU under nine and a half, right? Which is looking pretty good up to this point. But his reasoning more <laughs> so- along was more along the lines of, well, you, you, you called the secondary being having a huge lack of depth, which, Oh my gosh, it has been even in this game, it was terrible, right? In this game, it was even terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> but also part of the reason was, you know, you weren't as high on Jaden Daniels. And to be fair, I wasn't and, and- I wasn't scorching high on Jaden Daniels either. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, dude, but he is playing out of his nards right now. He he's electric to watch. And we talk about this every week. We break dude, you know, every so week he, he gets he runs out. straight up and down and he gets laid out and he's gonna get hurt. Like he's and we saw it in the game, he got yeah, I got hurt. drilled. Well, and I actually like, didn't get drilled, but like I got drilled a couple times, but and he had to set up for a couple of plays. Like that's not a sustainable way. First of all, when your defense is giving up literally anything, anything goes right now, and your quarterback is taking crazy hits, and there's so much on him. I get it, he didn't have a monster day in terms of numbers wise. He didn't put up 400 yards. That was Brady Cook, but he was really efficient, 15 for 21. He ran the ball super well, 15 for 130. And another touchdown, but what I do need to apologize for again is I also called out the running back room at LSU. I thought they were going to be a little bit of weakness, and and I was waiting for somebody to emerge. I was thinking maybe Noah Kane, right? Maybe uh, John Emery gets his act together, but no, Logan Diggs has been awesome for them. A real nice revelation. Obviously, that that wide receiver room is ridiculous, and and Mason Taylor's a good tight end as well. But there's just I still feel great about the under, right? Like Missouri was up big in this game and and it took LSU storming back in the second half. But I will give credit to LSU. They could have very easily folded. Very, very easily folded. I mean, they the second did half the week on the they road did last week. Yeah, I guess you're right. But they were also up in that game. Like it, it to me, this was a much different feeling. Like I, I I was very impressed with Brian Kelly being able to continue to rally the troops. And and get buying from his team even when they were down and come back and win an impressive football game. 20, 22 points in the fourth quarter, right? One of them was garbage time, whatever. Like 
still very, very impressive output in, in a game that, God. Yeah. It's, it's I'm, I mean, sure, Brady Cook had the big pick in the game, whatever. I would like to say sorry for thinking that Jeff Garcia was magnitudes better than Brady Cook. My, the Brady Cook slander for me preseason was real. It was real. And he is, <laughs> he is, so while we're, as long as we're on the apology tour, I'm, I will apologize to Brady Cook. And, sir, I did not, I did not recognize your game. You, uh, you've got some game, man. So I, I didn't think, uh, Missouri was going to win this game. They didn't. But, uh, yeah, I mean, still hats off to both these quarterbacks. They played awesome. Luther Burden, holy Christ, is that kid insane? That's an Illinois boy. Stud. Stud. So Cody Schrader also played pretty well, I think. Um I mean, how many how many what did, what did he have? What were his stats? He was well over a hundred yards. That dude was that dude's cooking too. I mean, Drinkwitz was right when he said that Cody Schrader was gonna have a thousand yards. Uh well, and he on did it way. on only thirteen K. He had 13 carries for 114 yards and obviously three touchdowns. But yeah, good player. Very good yeah. team. What what what's the ceiling of this Missouri team right now in terms of like looking ahead? Because obviously, you know, this game was a game you you would have loved to have. Obviously, I get it, you were underdogs in it, but it was there to be had in the second and a half. Um, obviously at home, Missouri's turned into a pretty pretty darn good environment there, especially when a very a pretty good team comes into town. Well, what's their yeah. ceiling in terms of? I think, I think Missouri's okay, right? I mean, right now, here are the data points that we have. They've had close games with Middle Tennessee, Memphis, Vanderbilt. They controlled the game, but uh, Kansas State, which that loss looks worse and worse by the second, or that win looks worse and worse by the second. And you know, you lose to LSU at home. Now LSU's a good team. We all know that, but uh. I'm not ready to say that they're like they they might give Georgia a scare. They could. I don't know, but uh they're going to at, Georgia, at Georgia so will be tough. That that's know? that's the thing. But I mean the ceiling of this Missouri team, which started five and one. I mean, the ceiling of this team, I think I mean you go to you go to Kentucky uh next weekend, but uh Tennessee you get at home, you get Florida at home, you're going to Arkansas, who has not played good football at all this year, and you get South Carolina at home. So if you're talking up Georgia as a loss. I mean, this team could go ten and two, nine and three, which would be absolutely incredible. You're like Eli Drinkwitz. Uh, can't complain if you're a Tiger fan, a Missouri Tiger yeah. fan, that is. Exactly. Good clarification there, and obviously it's gonna help in the recruiting trail with some high profile recruits that you're kind of battling for. Um, but regardless, though, I, yeah, I do think you said like the SEC East, other than Georgia, does any team like really, really impress you? Like Tennessee, you get them at home. Much different Tennessee team, I think, on the road versus at home. South Carolina has got a ton of question marks. Kentucky, we just saw get dismantled. To Arkansas, right? Arkansas at that point could be like a three win team, a four win team. Like who who knows? And and you get Florida at home again, which is a key point there. Not having to go to the swamp. Like I I, I see ten and two. Tennessee is very reasonable. I would think that's definitely on the upper echelon. I do feel like eight and four is much more reasonable, right? Maybe yep. you lose a game here or there. Regardless, though, still highly, highly impressive. Highly, highly impressive. And especially with a lot of the question marks on this roster, right? Brady Cook, man. Brady Cook's been awesome. And he's only a junior. You got him for, what, like one or two more years, depending on the COVID rules and whatever happened there. Like, who knows what college football eligibility nowadays? It's like the salary cap in the NFL. It's just like... Yeah, eligibility for some teams that works, some teams that doesn't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. But yeah, it, this is a this is a fun game, man. This is a fun game. Maryland at Ohio State. Uh, would you look at that? Pushed. Look at that. Yes. That? Come on now. So actually, both of our records that I had marked as a loss. We can bump those guys up. Uh, I'll update that after, but uh. If you're watching this, and if you're watching this as an individual breakdown, just ignore ignore that part. Go back and watch our full video, our full week six breakdown, and you'll understand um, when we picked games, what happened there. But yeah, I, let's get into this. Yeah, uh, look, first half, what was it tied 10-10? And 
And then right out of the half, Michael Oxley, <laughs> Kevin Sumlin, Josh Gaddis, go down and they score a touchdown. And you're like, holy cow. Where did these Terps go? Come on. But then the wheels just came off the track. Kyle McCord uh, dinked and dunked his way to 320 yards and a couple scores. I mean, was he that impressive? Tell me. Tell me, was was Kyle McCord insanely impressive? I, I was not. And let me tell you, yeah, it was 10-10 and a half. It was 10 nothing in the second quarter, and Maryland had the ball. And to a – I'm so sorry. Talia, kind of does what he does, and he turned the ball over. And, and there was a pick six there, and obviously changed the momentum of that game. But we talked about this. I, I don't even think it matters how Kyle McCord's playing right now in two weeks. I think it really will. Right when they go, they go, they host Penn State. Um, right, but that defense is awesome. We talked about this in the breakdown. Is this defense like Texas's defense? This defense is good enough to keep them in ball games, right? The Ohio State's the past three, four years lose this game. They absolutely lose this game, but the defense is good enough and, and makes a place to, to even spark their offense, which is or buy enough time for their offense to really lean on people and, and to realize, oh, we have Marvin Harrison Jr. We can just throw at him whenever we want. And Cade Stover's a baller too. He didn't get a target until like, you know, late in like like a while. Like it, it it's really interesting. It's a really interesting Ohio State team to watch this year. And not that I'm not high on them still. I just think I'm kind of waiting for it to click. Like you, you haven't seen them put together a full fourth quarter four quarter game, right? Obviously, Trayvon Henderson being out hurts that running game for sure, but. No offense to Maryland, and, and Mike Loxley's done a really good job building that program. This was a really well-coached football team, right? You saw them have some really sneaky plays in, right. in this game that, that saved them timeouts or penalties or whatever it was um, by Maryland coaching staff. But Ohio State should be able to line up whoever in that backfield and just kind of run the ball really, really well, and they didn't. They were under four yards of carry for the running backs. And I'm at Kabuka, where are you at, man? Julian Fleming, where are you at? Carnell Tate, the freshman, what, what's going on? Um, if you're going to beat the elite teams on your schedule, Penn State, Michigan, Georgia, whoever comes to the Big 12, Pac-12 champion, like you're going to need more than Marvin Harrison Jr. on your offense. Kyle McCord needs to step up. That old line, someone on the rushing game. Like your defense is good enough to win a national championship. Your defense is good enough to win a national championship. For Ohio State, that's the first time yeah. since 2014. That statement is true. And and you don't want to ruin it with 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 that pedestrian offense right now. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this: Imagine you're an AP voter, which you and I should both be AP voters based on some of the ballots that I've seen out there. Uh, Green, wild. But uh, how many how many teams are you ranking above Ohio State? This is an undefeated Ohio State, by the way, that has a win on the road against Notre Dame. I do think that that Notre Dame win on the surface looks less impressive now, but I still think it was very a very impressive win. Yes. Um. But outside of that, okay. Can I name some teams and and you can tell me whether you'd rank them above them? All right. Yes. Uh, Georgia. Georgia's above Ohio State. Uh, Michigan. Above Ohio State. Uh, Florida State. I think you could argue either way. I I still lean. I'd, I'd lean toward Ohio State. I think that Notre Dame win was more impressive than the LSU win. All right, uh, Oklahoma. Give me Oklahoma. Yeah, so that – yeah. And give me, I, I give me that... Oregon. Give me Washington maybe. All right, now, what, how, what? How, how many teams – how many teams – now, grant, ranking them right is different than, you know, picking them to win the game. How many – on a neutral side, how many of those teams are you picking the other team to win the game? Almost all of them. I think I'm picking the other team to win the game straight up as it currently constructs right now, as as it is right now. Correct. Yes, Correct. absolutely. Now the thing is when you're, when you're thinking about national championships, when you're thinking about teams like Ohio state, maybe Georgia, right? Two weeks ago that we're not playing elite football, but you have to think about this in, okay, what's the potential of this football team? Like I, I do think right now, Michigan boat races, Ohio state, right? Oklahoma and Texas, for that matter, Oregon, Washington. I think they both, Beat Ohio State. I went maybe not boat race. I'll take that part back. But I do think those teams are playing a lot better football right now than Ohio State and just as talented. 
The problem is, is once Ohio State clicks on offense, not once, if, if they click on offense, much different football team, much more dangerous football team. And that's where, you know, you, my mind is right now. It's caught up in the, oh, the potential of this team and the offense. Um, But yeah, good point. Great point. Yeah. So also, well, let's not just talk about Ohio State. Let's talk about Maryland, right? This team. I like Maryland. I like this team. Uh, there are, I'll point out four games left on their schedule. They're five and one at this point. Remember that Illinois, Northwestern, Nebraska, Rutgers. Oh, those four, oh my God, man. Those four teams are left on their schedule. Like this, this is a team that could go nine and three. I mean, they also play Penn state and Michigan. Both of those games at home though. Just yeah. saying, uh, pretty scary, but like, oh, what, what happens if, wait, real quick though, hypothetical while we're talking, Talking about Maryland's schedule. What happens if they pull this game out, right? Now, obviously, I feel like they lost by 20 points, but didn't even cover. But they were in position, you know, to really make the game competitive. And then Dude. you're undefeated Maryland with a tiebreaker over Ohio State, and you have Penn State and Michigan as, right, you're both at home. Like, pandemonium. Like that, would, that would be crazy. And obviously, it didn't happen. We're not thinking about that. But I think your point is, is Maryland's got a, a really favorable schedule outside of the two really tough games um in Penn State and Michigan. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean they draw from the West, which I thought originally was I thought it was okay, right? You pull when you pull Northwestern from the West, right, you celebrate. Right, obviously. Except if you're Minnesota. God damn it, man. But they they pulled Illinois and I'm like, well that that's a tough game. I was really high on Illinois was wrong to be that way on Illinois was absolutely wrong to be that way on Illinois. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk some of my bigger misses this off season was Illinois being a very good football team. That was my, one of my biggest misses for sure. But yeah, yes. Maryland's got a shot to go to win nine games. They got a shot to win 10. If they somehow pull an upset, there'll be two touchdown underdogs in both those games at home. But uh, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be incredible. I mean, and Mike Loxley, what are we saying about Michael Loxley then after that? Like, is he, is he being talked about for bigger jobs? Like, is he, you know, I, I don't know. He has done a phenomenal job with this program, I think. For sure. No, I, I do think he deserves a lot of credit. And I think, right, in terms of, like, expansion and the future of Maryland program, nobody is happier to get rid of divisions than Maryland. Nobody is happier. And nobody deserves it more than Maryland. Now, also, with that same being said, like, your schedule is not going to get any easier, I don't think. You're still going to have to play – might get harder quality teams, which is why exactly like, like th- there's going to be years where maybe it's easier and maybe you have a chance to make a run and be in the top 12, pick a playoff berth. And there's going to be, te- there's going to be years where you probably go five and seven with a really loaded roster. Um, Mar- for Maryland's sake, loaded roster, but yeah, I, I did credit Mike Loxley, right? He slowly people kind of forgot about him. I think Tali has been there forever. We'll see what ha- happens when he goes and graduates, but it, th- they're. Year in and year out, you know, it's a good roster with some pretty good NFL players. You see it come draft season. Oh, Maryland's yeah. got some nice, nice talent there. And and this year will be no different. Gosh, I love G5 football. Fresno State at Wyoming, headed to Laramie. We know Laramie is a tough barn to play in. And those Cowboys... Put a put a leash and collar on these dogs, kind of. I mean, they did. They they controlled this game. They controlled this game. I mean, yeah, Wyoming finds a way to win a ball game. I Mikey Keene wasn't really spectacular. Uh, they need it's tough to throw the ball in Laramie, dude. It is. It doesn't matter. Like ten mile crosswinds or nineteen mile per hour crosswinds, the thin air, man. It is. It is hard to play. It is hard to play in the mountains in Wyoming. And this team, this Wyoming team is gritty. Their defense is playing very, very well this season. They're finding ways to win the games. That's all you need. That's a formula. Do uh, you have any extracurricular thoughts on this game? It was tough to see Mikey King go down. Um, obviously, I, he's played super well of you course. Know, leading up to this game. Hopefully, he's okay. You know, I think they welcome or they have Utah State coming in next there. Um, but, I mean, Fafi, Fifi, right? Whatever. Like he played pretty well. He, Logan, he Logan Five. I think it's Logan Five. Five. Thank you. Yeah. 
but they did not get any help from the ground game there. And we talked about it in the preview where if this is a game right in the low teens, low or the high teens, low twenties, where you're running the ball well and Fresno state, it turns into a physical matchup. This, this definitely favors Wyoming and that's what it turned into. And boom, we know Wyoming won the football game. Yeah. Harrison Whaley, very good football player. Right, it wasn't overly spectacular in terms of statistics, but he got it done. Yeah, got the, got I mean, the you give the, they... the ball twenty-two times. I mean, you're that's a you you know you trust a guy. You, they weren't abandoning the ground game because it it was working to a degree, right? Setting up some third and shorts, giving Wyoming a chance. Exactly, and and, and Peasley did enough. Right, it was nineteen to twenty-seven, super efficient, three touchdowns. Um, well, that'll get it done. And Wyoming, especially in Laramie, has. A formula to win football games, especially against right Mountain West opponents. Right, They're, it's a very, very successful formula, I'd say. And and to be honest, they got some tough games up. Boise State's playing better. Air Force is obviously no joke. We know that. We respect Air Force more than anybody, maybe, um, in UNLV. But it's awesome. Hey, it's I'll, great I'll, to I'll see. say this uh, for you, Mountain West fans, G five fans. I, I have three G five teams ranked. Top twenty five in my twenty five ranking top twenty five rankings. Is Fresno have... State still ranked? No, I'm sorry. It's depth depth at the top end of that that that, that league. I uh the, the three G five teams I have are Air Force, James Madison, and Wyoming. In that order, pretty much all Air right Force. next to each other. Dude, I mean. Love me, loving me. I I really like the Mountain West this year. I, now, at the top, I think just some of these teams are just really frisky, right? They can just win games that they're not supposed to. Uh, I'm not going to say that this is by any stretch of the imagination a really elite conference of football. I would be. That would be. I don't even know. That that'd be just. Be, it's. It'd let's, be let's, let's call it. Let's call it incorrect. Let's just call it incorrect. It would for be, the respect be, of the Mountain West. It, it would be incorrect to say that, all right? But gosh, I love this Wyoming team a lot. Uh, I also still like this Fresno State team. Still like this Fresno State team, uh, dude. It's gonna be it's gonna be so bad. I mean, Fresno State plays Air Force next week, right? Wyoming does. Wyoming. Does. Oh, um, Wyoming's in the Air Force. Oh, Fresno State avoids Air Force, which we talked about in the last segment. It's a big deal, and isn't that awesome to say that sentence yeah. where you avoid the Air Force? That's I right. Do that's think- right. That's right. I do think Fresno State is outside of Laramie is a really good football team in the Mountain West. I do think they're going to make some noise, and I don't think that's obviously not, not a bold take. It's not a very insightful take, but I think even after a loss, I'm I think we, we both are. We, we still believe in Fresno State, Mikey Keene, obviously if he's healthy. Um, but yeah, Wyoming man, Wyoming, 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 awesome, awesome to see that. You better believe we're covering them again next week. Oh, that that's a, that that is a a very I don't want to call it a massive game, but it's unjust. It's a huge game. It's a huge game on, for the Mountain West. And like like BCS or no, I'm wow New wow. Year's Six bowl game Whoa. implication like like the G five bowl game is a is a big deal right very big deal that invite. Air Force and Wyoming are two teams that are going to be fighting for that, and and that, that could decide it. Obviously, the American in Tulane and SMU, Memphis as well. I'm going to have some words to say about that, but this Mountain West and and I'm sorry, I forgot the Sun Belt. We love the Sun Belt here too. Oh, James but, James Madison, absolute Troy wagons yeah. wagons. So sorry, sorry, it's us, Charlie Jalen Rayner. I mean, it's a tough barn we, to play. We, your first road, we wanted your to, first true road game. We wanted to take that game, but we just we just couldn't. We just couldn't, and and we're I, glad we stayed I, away. Well, I couldn't. I couldn't. But yeah, let's go Mountain West. Come on, upset meter. Wow, dude, this is how this is the order in which we put our our stinky upsets uh, for this week. This is why we do this segment. By the way, too. And this is why we do this segment. This this is a perfect example of why we do this, right? USC. I mean. Probably should have lost that game. And we had him right there, right around, you know, more than sweating, steaming, possible. And that was the biggest spread on this entire list, by the way. 21 and a half. It was, yeah. Which, so, to a lot of people, was like, oh, what, what are we even talking about here? No, that was, the matchup was there. 
Kansas State. Yikes, dude. Mike Gundy masterclass. Just, and we talked about this. I was a week early. I was a week early when I was talking about Mike Gundy. Oh, I was a couple weeks early. Does it? He finds a way. Ollie Gordon, a stud. Alan Bowman, they finally stuck with a guy. And, oh, would you look at that? Uh, he made some plays. So Yeah. <laughs> he made some plays. He made some he plays. Made, he, Will, he, Will Howe also had some plays for them. I mean, three interceptions. Obviously, the pick six was kind of pe- very, very huge at the end of the half. What are you doing there? I, I get it. I love being aggressive at the end of the half. We talked talk about it with Jim Fisher. I love being aggressive in, in, at the end of the first half. But what was that like an out and up? Like what? Why are you running that? And why are you throwing that? Well, Howard, you're an experienced enough quarterback to not do that, especially on the road as the better football team. Yeah, Kansas State disappointing. But good for Mike Gundy, man. We can be happy for him on this program. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in hindsight, you and I could both look at this and be like, okay, USC, we probably should have had a little bit higher, like you know, into actual steaming territory. And Kansas State, we probably should have had into more sweating territory. Um, Miami, though, I'm a, like, I'm stunned. I, I, like, even after watching that game, I would, I would still put it. I would still put them in the cold mild, like here. I would still put yeah. them right here. They outgained them by, like, 300 yards before that last play. I mean, they, there's no reason they should have lost the game. By the, And then, of course, do we have to talk about the kneel down or not kneeling? Which is, by the way, is not the not the first time that Mario Cristobal has done that. I mean, what 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 are we doing? What are we actually doing? So I, and then of well, course, just to kick so, me in the nuts, sometimes right, as an A&M fan, Haynes King beating Miami on the road. <laughs> That's incredible. That's an awesome that throw. Okay, I get we're talking about. Yes, Miami lost the game. Like sometimes in college football, like like Van Dyke threw what three picks or something like that too. Like yeah, sometimes college football people people are like oh the team lost the other team didn't win it. Like in this case, literally Miami handed the game to Georgia Tech. But also like in college football, you still have to take the game. You still have to reach out and grab it, and they did. Christian Leary right in his one catch all day he had crazy touchdown. Haynes King right had a hundred yards. 100 yards, but less than 100 yards before that, <laughs> before that drive. Um, and he pulled it out. Gutsy, gutsy performance. Very happy for Brent Key. Very happy. Very happy for my over four and a half prediction. Very, very happy. <laughs> As a Georgia Tech guy. It kind of washes out. That's also why it's frustrating because you lost to Bowling Green by 11 points the week before. Right? So, like, wild. But wild. also, Again, another lesson we talk about this all the time. Highs and lows happen all the time. They even out a lot in college football. Um, and we saw that here. And it sucks for Miami because we were both really excited to see what they did in the ACC. Really, really excited. And they can still do everything they want to. They went out, right? They can, they can do some damage for sure. But, yeah. I, do. I still think it's Miami. Go- Although, hey, remember when we talked about, though? What did we talk about, though? What, what what was the strength of this Georgia Tech team? If you can remember when we were previewing this team, what was the strength of this team? It was the second. It was the secondary, which yeah, absolutely was horrendous against Bowling Green. But that's a whole other story. But yeah. the athleticism is there, and they made plays. I don't know. So I guess the lesson here is Mario Cristobal and Jimbo Fisher have completely mismanaged games and found a way to give the team the least possible chance of winning a ball game. And they're great recruiters. And obviously I, I do think Chris ball will succeed at Miami. I Jimbo has done good things at a and but they failed. They failed these kids, man. And that, that's, that's the hard part is you put, you put your, your body on the line all week, all summer and you just lose. And that sucks. Moving on to Michigan, though, damn, that, I mean, we saw it coming. <laughs> There's a reason it was below cold. It was literally below cold. And um, on our on our upset meter, and, geez, from the second snap, they just bullied Minnesota, bullied them all game. And, and they gave up. Minnesota gave up. They, they ran the ball. They passed the ball like four times. 
in the second half. And like, I get it. Like you weren't having any success throwing the ball anyways, but like, why the fuck is Bryce Williams still getting carries? Excuse my language. I am really, really sorry. But, and I don't like to, to call out specific players for being bad. He is horrible. He, he is not a good football player. And it is unjustful to sit Zach Evans and Sean Tyler. And obviously when Dara Taylor gets back healthy, none of this will matter. But like, it is a disservice to those players and the rest of the team to continue to have him coming out there and get carries and just go down easily at first contact. I mean, golly. That's my rant. Not, not the reason they lost, though, of course. Oh, well, no. I, and and he, he's getting astray because I'm a frustrated Minnesota fan right now. And, and while maybe he doesn't deserve that, it doesn't Same way. He's not very I, always, good. I always have a bullet in the chamber for DJ Durkin. I do. Every single Which time. is fair. And, and, and to be honest, that's way better than what I did because you don't have to coach his – Right, they're grown men. They're actually professionals. They're getting paid for it. Way different than going after a kid. I'm sorry, Bryce Williams. I'm really sorry. Play better next time, though. <laughs> yeah. Better. So, but yeah, it feels like though, like the order of the sweatiness. I think we got. I think we nailed the order of the sweatiness. Now it ended up being Kansas State losing. But I think, dude, Arizona should have won that game, man. What are you doing off going for two? By the way. In that situation, you're gonna to have to go for two anyways in overtime. Like, what? What? What are we doing? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, and Win the ball. Again. The overtime rules are just just criminal, man. Let it's those two teams it. duel until like two in the morning, three in the morning, <laughs> right? I yeah. I get it. You know, you're trying to save bodies and turn it into a fun gimmicky whatever, but there's no way to decide a football game, especially with two teams that fought that hard all game. I agree, one hundred percent. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to Retro Software Podcast once again. That's our week six recap. Be sure to tune us tune in on Thursday when we post week seven previews. That's right. We're already week seven. Brutal, man. We're over halfway Enjoy done with the regular last. season. Enjoy it while it lasts. We're already over halfway done. It's incredible. We love doing this. We love you guys' support. Uh, 85 subscribers on YouTube. Would never have thought we would have gotten to this point at this point in the season. So thank you guys for that. Keep checking us out. Share with us or share our content with other guys uh, and girls, of course. Like the video, subscribe. If you like the content, like the video. It's that simple. That's the rule, right? Um, but thank you guys so much. Make sure to email us at the Richard Sophomore at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, the Richard Soft. Always post on there. Love interacting with guys. Uh, email us, DM us, whatever. Comment on this video. Let us know what's going on. We love hearing from you guys. Anything else, CD? No, it's been it's been a blessing. If you're watching this video at this point, thank you. Thank you for support. We appreciate it. Let us know. We love to hear your feedback, like he said. And we'll, we can't wait to get into week seven. We got, again, do not sleep. Do not schedule anything for this weekend on Saturday. A lot more to talk about. A lot more games to break down. We'll get into that this week. And then, obviously, we'll be watching the games on Saturday and, and breaking them down on, on Monday. So, yeah. Yeah, and we will see you guys in the next one.